First question I yeah. have for you is, how do I pick the right speakers for my space? I would say the number one spec is coverage. You want to make sure, uh, just like if think of yourself as a reverse lighting designer. So if you are hanging lights, I want to make sure everyone on the stage is lit. You pick a fixture and you aim at that person. Like we all understand a flashlight needs to be aimed at someone and shined. So turn that rig around. But think of speakers that have different angles. Some are wide, uh, some are narrow and have different purposes. We want to make sure every person is within basically this cone um, of sound, not silence, uh, and is covered. Uh, that's always published by the manufacturer, their coverage specs. So that the K12 I mentioned earlier is a 75 degree by 75 degree speaker. So it's going to have a horizontal coverage as well as a vertical versus in the QSC line, there's also the KLA12 which is a constant curvature speaker, but it's, I think, 100 degrees by 18 degrees, or 90 by 18, excuse me. Um, so not all speakers in how they cover are created equal. So is there some kind of software to help visualize, like, how is this going to cover my space that you use? Or, I mean, otherwise, we're just looking at 90 degrees, 50 degrees. I don't really know what that means, so... So there's one uh, called Ease Focus 3, and I have a tutorial on it on my YouTube channel, and it's pretty approachable. Even for someone who might be brand new uh, to audio, it's really like, okay, let me draw a rectangle about the size of my audience. Let me add in a speaker, put it about 10 feet high, maybe you can get it up that high in a stick and point it this way, and what happens? And it's going to show you the equivalent of a weather map, um, uh, almost like how loud it is in each seat. And if you can look at it and like, okay, is there a big change from front to back or left to right? Then you might need more speakers. You might need to position them differently to make sure that everyone is getting a similar experience. That's awesome. So I guess that same software would probably help you determine how you need to aim them. Like say you're hanging them from the ceiling and you're going to angle them down to figure out what that angle needs to be. More often than not, and here's a little cheat code for you. If you're aiming just a single point source at your audience, you need to point it at head height at your last row at the very back. You would think like, shouldn't I point at the middle of the audience so I could take advantage of the top part of the speaker, my bottom, but it's actually the center of a speaker's throw, which has is the loudest and that kind of tapers off as you move to the edge. So we want the center of it at your back row and use the bottom half of that speaker coverage to get to your front row. So in general, are you just eyeballing that or do you have some kind of technique where you're using like a laser pointer or I'm just curious, how do you make sure that you're actually pointing it at that last row? Yeah. So there, there are three ways. Eyeball it. Second is actually get out a laser and put it on the speaker and you can get a, a buddy to stand back there and hold up a piece of paper or something and aim it. And third is to actually measure it with microphones. So what I do when I tune a system is I take measure microphones that give me data and I can put one at the front row, maybe the middle of the audience in the very back. And as I tilt that speaker, I'm going to get different data. And basically, I want it to be as similar as possible front to back. So I can basically look at those as guidelines to know where I should aim it. Again, you learn that in my course and what all that data means and how to use it. Uh, but I would say that's I'll probably say the most precise way to do it is to verify it with that data when you're tuning. What's awesome is there is actually an open source software out right now called Open Sound Meter that's available for Windows and Mac and Linux if you're that kind of person. Um, and so you can get that. It's free. It, I guess it's a pay what you want model. So definitely donate if you find it useful. Uh, but if you want to dive in and get smart, that's the other one that I use. Smart has a few other features that are more like creature comforts that make things faster and more fluid for me to work. But open sound meter is the, almost the exact same math under the hood. So I'm not going to do necessarily a better job in smart because I get better data. Open sound meter is still going to serve me super well. And I've tuned like multiple large PA systems with open sound meter just to kind of test it out for fun. And I got really good results and, and you can too. So definitely check it out. So we've talked about coverage when we're picking our speakers, but we also need to talk about power. How do I know how much power that I need for my space? They're going to do a published spec of what the SPL is one meter in front of the speakers. Pretty common. So a little over three feet. So I think a K12 uh, at one meter, it's a weighted SPL is 132 dB, which is a lot. So don't crank a K12 all the way at one meter away <laughs> or you'll lose your hearing. But most of our audiences are farther than that. And our mix isn't going to be this like pink noise or even sine tone level all the way at the top. It's going to be averaging below that and peaking up there. Let's say our first row, just for easy math, is now five meters or about 15 feet away is what we end at. So we can now say, well, that is five times farther and I can basically 
make an equivalent of what is that in, in a decibel drop. What I know for sure is a 4X is a 12 dB drop. So a little bit more than that is about 15 dB. And so if I'm all the way at the top, if it's 132 minus 15 dB, I'm sitting at, is at 117 decibels, right? Um, and so we don't need 117, but that's the very top of the mix. And I would say a live mix has a crest factor or a difference between the average and the peak level of usually anywhere between 16 to 20 dB. So if you want to be conservative, I would say take the level drop over distance, subtract another 20 decibels, and that is what you're going to live at at that given point. So if we took our further math of, you know, a 5x drop about 15 dB to that first row, we were at 117, subtract 20 dB, that's 97 decibels. So in the front row, front row if I'm pushing a K12 up to its, mo like right before it's going to start breaking down and limiting whatever, I can get comfortably to 97 dB. Makes sense. It's interesting because probably most people listening were looking at the wattage factor of a speaker, but they're probably looking at the wrong spec all this time. It's hard because wattage is only as good as the speaker's sensitivity. Like how good is it at translating that wattage into actual sound pressure? Uh, active speaker that has the power amp built in, like that's not published. And so if it's a passive speaker, it can give you that, but some people don't even publish that. So it, it really is hard. And is it going to sound good that loud? Like what distortion spec did they publish that? Here's what is going to be true all over. The larger the woofer, the more linear it's going to stay, the louder you push it. So if I try to push a little 8-inch guy versus a 12, a 12-inch guy is going to get louder and cleaner than an 8-inch. Yeah, so that brings up another question. How do you pick the right size of woofer? Like, is there a benefit to going smaller over larger? If someone said you could either have a larger woofer but not quite enough coverage or more than enough coverage and a, but a little bit smaller woofer, I would always pick more coverage every time. Look at what coverage you need first to fit your audience area and then if you know you're going to want things on the louder side, get the largest driver size you can up to a 15, um, I'd say, uh, to be able to accomplish that. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, yeah. Back to picking the right power. Like, say, I want to run my services at 95 decibels. Is there a certain uh, overhead that I want to protect the speaker to maybe... Will the speaker last longer if I have some overhead? Do I get more longevity out of it? What say you... Absolutely. I would say give yourself at least three dB of headroom, if not six. Power uh, on the decibel scale, three dB is a doubling. If you get a thousand watt amplifier and then you have a 2000 watt amplifier, you're not getting a six dB increase in power. You're only getting a three dB increase in power. Um, and so uh, just know like, oh man, I've doubled my wattage. Well, you've got three more dB of power <laughs> and how that translates to SPL may or may not get all the mileage you want. Um, so that being said, yes, having some headroom is helpful. Most speakers these days have built-in limiters to help protect, even if you are hitting them. But like you said, you're not going to get as much life in them if you're just sitting in limit the whole time. It's not going to sound very good. So you're saying three to six dB of headroom is a good mm -hmm. thing to aim for. Is there Absolutely. is there any downside if you have, say, 12 dB of headroom? Does the speaker not sound as good when you're not giving it the right, like a certain amount of power? Two things at play here. What separates some of maybe the upper tier products or brands from the lower tier are two main things. Is the linearity over SPL? Does it sound the same at low volumes versus high volumes? And then the other is that the coverage pattern is gonna be consistent. So anyone can publish a, a spec online. If you put a measurement microphone in front of a speaker and it looks really flat, you're like, oh, this is a cool flat speaker. But if it's within 90 degrees and you move off axis, what you want is a smooth taper off in the top end, but cheaper speakers, if you move off axis, it's going to get more jagged and not be as a fluid transition through the high frequencies. Uh, so those are two things you're paying for. You're not going to lose anything by having too big of a speaker in your space. You just have to be cognizant um, of any noise floor issues because you are running your signal a lot lower because the, the voltage multiplication in the speaker is a lot higher. So you just have to pay a little bit more attention to how you gain structured things so you don't run into noise floor issues. Uh, but it's not going to hurt you. You will just be more linear since a bigger driver is not having to work as hard to get the same SPL. Dylan, do you have any questions you want to add to that? Um, so I was going to ask what your favorite reference mic is and how much money should you have to spend to get a, an accurate one? Absolutely. Uh, the ones that I use and love are the iSimCon EMX 7150s. They're about $325 US dollar, uh, right now. 
Uh, and I would say, even if you order the, the Behringer, the Dayton audio $99 one, it's still going to get you good data. Uh, actually, I actually have a friend, Michael Lawrence, who did a comparison between seven different microphones all in the same spot and looked at the data and they all pretty much matched. So what you're paying for is the longevity of the microphone and the accuracy over time. Um, and its ability to handle really, really high SPL levels. And the IsomCon can do that. The Something like the Behringer cannot. It's actually held together with hot glue on the inside. Is it worth it to spend $800 on the Earthworks? You're not going to get better data. I'll tell you that than the $300 one. So if you want to have it just because it's a wonderful drum overhead mic or whatever, fantastic. But it's not going to get you any better or clear data even than the Behringer. And then I was going to ask, this might be a loaded question, but what do you find is like the most powerful and comfortable SPL level in most rooms in churches. I usually hang out in the low nineties, like 91, 92 a weighted, uh, from the middle of the audience. And so, uh, I would say get a calibrated mic that can actually handle the SPL and really measure it. Don't use someone's iPhone app because there's even articles on how like they was very wildly and look at it in the front row, look at it in the middle of your audience, look at it in the back row, look at it in front of house. Because you may say, hey, I was only like 92 at front of house. What are you whining about? And you go to the front row, like, oh, my word, those front fills are screaming. It's 99. And, and then uh, and also know that loudness is always up to the Fletcher Munson curve or the frequency balance of the mix as well. Your ears going to perceive things differently at different levels. And then um, some some people don't have a lot of vocabulary to say this is loud versus just bright and tin and harsh. So for me, a well-balanced mix in a decent room for me, I like 91, 92. What's the SPL level where you say like you're getting dangerously close to like actually damaging people's ears. Mm, it, it, it's all about exposure and in time. The reason why none of us go deaf if uh, someone fires fireworks right next to us, it's, it's, it's a transient. It's like there and gone. It's sustained loudness, which gets us. So if it's a lot of fireworks, bing, 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 that's a lot. As a general rule of thumb, if you're hitting over 100 dB A weighted for any longer than like a song, it's not good, uh, in, in my personal opinion. Um, and so, and you also have to think about A weighted is a really good guess guesstimation of how the human ear perceives loudness is basically filters out a lot of low end and the extra top end, but you can also get a lot of damage done from low frequencies. So if you're in the front row at an EDM festival and they get just got piles of double 18s, that's, that's not good either. Um, so you need to look at your C weighted exposure as well, but within smart, I think the latest update of open sound meter, you can actually look at the loudness both with, uh, I'm uh, the, the acronyms escaping me, but I think it's N I O S H versus OSHA. So it's two different weightings of loudness level over time. And it's a percentage value, an hour long concert. I think at about 95, you hit your OSHA exposure. And I get, I need to refer to my friend, Michael Lawrence, who's written multiple papers on this and can fact check me here, but, um, it's in the software. Uh, I need to brush up on it some more, but it's all about time and intensity. And you would say that's really important because you're responsible for people's hearing long term, right? Exactly. I, I don't think it's paid enough attention to because people may come to your service and may not say, hey, it's too loud, but it is uninformed consent to something harmful. And so not everyone can be aware of like what's happening. It may just be like, yeah, it's just kind of ringing or whatever. But you, we, we know that's harmful. So we need there and we are, in, we are directly in control of it on this thing that's a hundred millimeters tall of what that looks like. And so, uh, we need to work harder, um, to make sure that our mixes are still full and enveloping and inviting and people want to participate because there's really cool, you know, studies of like how your body gets involved with things when it's feeling it. And it's a really cool communal experience where it's just a concert or a Sunday service. Um, and there is a sweet spot I feel, and it happens to be in the low nineties apparently for me, but it, uh, it, it's different for different genres and applications. Well, I got one final question for you. If you only had like one minute with somebody, say you're somebody in passing and they asked you, what's your number one tip for designing a PA in a small church? What's that one thing that you'd give them if you only had a minute to tell them something? So whatever speakers you have, line up, divide your audience in half. Take the speaker stands, put them on the middle of those two halves. So it'd be like high quarters. Put those speakers as high up as you can on those speaker stands and then aim them through the middle of the middle of those two zones. Even if you have too wide or too skinny, it's at least covering the most amount of people. 
And I would say speaker stands too low. It's going to be really loud in the front, not loud off the back. Get them up high. It's going to help spread out and make it that discrepancy smaller and cover more. Sweet, man. You made it simple. I love it. Well, thanks for being with us, man. This has been crazy valuable. Why don't you tell everybody how they can stay connected with you? Because I'm sure they're like, man, I got to hear more from this guy. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I've got my own YouTube channel. Just put in Michael Curtis audio into the search bar and I'll find it or produced by mkc.com is my formal blog and courses and training and all that. Um, right now doing a lot on system design, but also starting to put out some more videos on live mixing. Uh, both I actually just posted one last week on me mixing in my church, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, check that out on YouTube and my website. 